Good afternoon. My name is Julie Caffley. I'm Executive Vice President of the Public Policy Forum and delighted to have you join us for the second session this afternoon, um, where we're going to really explore um, the role of post-secondary uh, in terms of the changes related to COVID and, and the, the changing nature of work. Um, I'd like to acknowledge this morning uh, that I'm on the unceded territory of the Algonquin people. Um, I'd encourage you to learn more about your Indigenous territory. You can um, look up, there's a website actually created by a Public Policy Forum fellow, uh, Karen Ristool, native-land.ca, and you can learn more about your Indigenous territory. So this afternoon we're joined from, um, from experts uh, from across three uh, different traditional territories. I'd like to start off by introducing Tash Sudwick. Um, she's from Kiwani First Nation. She's currently the Associate Vice President, Indigenous Engagement and Reconciliation at the newly named Yukon University. Congratulations for that big change that you've been instrumental in helping to advance, Tosh. And uh, thanks for joining us today from Whitehorse. Sophie Damour, qui est la rectrice à, à l'Université Laval à Québec, c'est une ingénieure par formation et présentement la présidente de l'Université Canada. Merci beaucoup, Sophie, d'être avec nous cet après-midi. And finally, Benoit Antoine Bacon, who's currently the president of Carleton University. Um, he's a neuropsychologist by training and uh, delighted to have him uh, with us this morning as well. So welcome to all of you. We look forward to this discussion. As you know, this is day three of our conference. And yesterday, um, I was struck by uh, some of the sobering comments um, by some of our speakers. And Wendy Sukir um, from Ryerson spoke about this lost generation of young people and really the long-term implications of COVID for this generation. And of course, education is the largest factor uh, in terms of success and social mobility. We have um, young people who are really the hardest hit in a lot of this. Um, and this impact is going to likely stretch over their lifetime. Um, and so I'd like to talk a bit about the role of your institutions in all of this. Of course, the students are not on campus right now. They're less connected, potentially at a time where they need to be more connected. And so I'd like to talk a bit about that. Maybe I could start with you, Tosh. I think that's a great point, Julie. And, it, you know, two of the things that come to mind for me right away are there are some very significant digital divides uh, already present pre-COVID. Uh, we see that in the North, particularly with our students in rural, remote Indigenous communities. And so that divide is widening. And we have an obligation as post-secondary institutions, not only to help challenge the entire country to deal with that digital divide and explain what the ramifications from not doing that is, but also preparing our learners for how they can connect in this new world. And I, I think one of the things that is a, a bonus uh, from COVID is that we now have an opportunity to shift away from a very traditional model towards something that is going to upskill our, our students to de deliver what they need to deliver in this new world. And I, you know, I think Benoit has said it before, and I, I agree with him that universities and colleges have a great capacity to pivot when we need to really quickly. Um, and I've seen that across the country with really fast responses on that. The key will be, how do we make sure that we're bringing our faculty and our staff with, along with our students to produce quality uh, and accessible programming that's gonna prepare them for this new future? And I, I look at the changes that are happening in K-12 already prior to, to COVID coming out, and we knew that we were gonna have technological learners on our hands very quickly. Um, it's just, this has sped that piece up. And the last thing I, I think we, uh, we really have to focus on is making sure that that education is not only relevant, but it's accessible and I, I really see a huge opportunity, particularly for those learners, Indigenous learners in remote communities, to increase the breadth of programming that's going to be available because they're no longer going to have to leave their community to go down and take an engineering degree. Uh, and so COVID is pushing us into places that I, I think are going to be beneficial. We just really have to focus on capitalizing that opportunity for, for all of our learners across the country. Thank you, Tosh. Uh, Benoit, I'll go to you next, and if you could talk about um, how you're seeing this from the perspective of, of Carleton. I know that Carleton has, has been a leader in terms of students with disabilities in particular, and I know you're a big advocate for mental health as well. So maybe you could talk about um, how you see this uh, through Carleton's lens. Thanks so much, uh, Julie, and uh, thanks to Public Policy Forum for including universities and in, uh, this important conversation. And uh, it's such an honor to be on a panel with Tosh and uh, Safi. Great to see you both, and uh, we're two minutes in, and Tosh has already agreed with me, so that's going to be a good day. Uh, I appreciate that very much. Uh, I, I do want to come back quickly on what Wendy said about the lost generation. Uh, I don't think it's lost yet, uh, but it's at risk. 
Uh, I am worried uh, about uh, the young people, uh, whether they're the ones that are now uh, trying to finish high school, grade 11, grade 12, uh, in a very disrupted environment. Uh, they will be uh, lacking in some uh, basic skills and learning objectives uh, when they reach uh, university next year. Uh, our own uh, students, of course, uh, but also those that have uh, recently graduated and that are not yet established. Uh, so that's about 10 years uh, of uh, young people that are uh, at risk of having a rougher start uh, in life uh, in terms of their professional career uh, that, that, than we have had. And that's a concern for all of us because they are the people, uh, it's a truism, uh, that will uh, soon be leading our industries and our government and our country. Uh, they're also the people who will be funding uh, our health care and our pensions. So we need to make sure that they start uh, well uh, in, uh, in life and, uh, and universities that uh, take that extremely seriously. Um, I think part of our role is to anticipate the future uh, so that we can prepare our students for that future, but that's surprisingly hard to do. Uh, it's not only what society will need, uh, but also what kind of skills uh, the student will need to face that future in a way that is uh, adaptable uh, and uh, flexible. Um, there, there's several components of this, but I know we're pressed for, for time. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the role of university in developing thinking. Uh, again, it's a truism, but we forget that. We think it's about knowledge acquisition. Uh, it's not so much about the what you learn uh, or what you think. It's about uh, how you develop the ability uh, to learn and how uh, you think. And uh, especially with uh, the rise of social media now, uh, it seems uh, sufficient to hold a position to be considered a thinking being, uh, but all holding a position is not thinking, is just repeating something that you've heard elsewhere. So uh, learning how to think is a transformative experience. Uh, and I think uh, the more complex uh, the world is, and the more challenging the problems uh, that we have to address, uh, the more the ability to think, uh, to truly think both sides of the issue uh, will be uh, particularly uh, important. Uh, you, you asked that I speak uh, specifically to uh, uh, people with disabilities, and thank you for that, because it's been uh, a strength at Carleton University for a long time, as you know. Uh, for people who haven't been on our campus at Carleton, uh, it all started with our tunnels, with our underground tunnels. Uh, about uh, 40 years ago, we have uh, six, uh, six kilometers of underground tunnels uh, that people in wheelchairs uh, found extraordinarily practical uh, in going from one bu building to the next. So on that, we developed a, a long-standing expertise uh, in adapting our spaces, our curriculum, and now our technology for people with uh, disability. Uh, and uh, these numbers are rising, not only at Carleton, but, but everywhere. Uh, they're now in the 10 to 20% range, uh, not only physical disabilities or sensory disabilities, uh, but uh, cognitive or neuro disabilities, uh, neurodiversity, as I like to say. Uh, it's a big proportion of the population, and I'm proud to say uh, that at Carleton, students uh, that uh, self-identify as having a disability succeed just as well uh, as students uh, who don't, uh, and that's true inclusion. Uh, where we see a gap is in the employment of our graduates uh, with disabilities, so we started a new uh, uh, initiative that we call uh, the David C. Onley uh, initiative in partnership with the province of Ontario for the employment of people with disabilities. Uh, and uh, what we found uh, in the, the first round uh, of, that, of that initiative is that it's not that the people uh, are less employable, uh, but there are barriers to employment on the side of uh, institutions that seek to employ. And that's a complex problem. Why is there such a barrier uh, to employment? Uh, to very, very quickly, uh, two things. Uh, em employers seem to overestimate uh, the costs and the challenges in employing people with disabilities, uh, which are most of the time zero, uh, but people do uh, overestimate uh, these uh, challenges. And two, even when institutions make uh, ambitious plans to hire, say, like uh, the, the Canadian public uh, function, 5%, of people with disability, uh, when it gets to the middle managers who do the hiring, uh, they find that uh, getting these uh, uh, directives to be implemented are extremely uh, complicated. It doesn't filter down the organization, and that's a lost opportunity, uh, not to mention uh, falling, fall, falling way short of our standards of equity in this country. Merci beaucoup, Benoit. Um, Sophie, on, on peut répondre en français ou en anglais, on a la traduction, donc c'est à vous de décider, mais j'aimerais ça vous parler un peu de, des étudiants qui sont pris dans le milieu, que ce soit les, les apprenants qui sont plus âgés, à temps partiel, 
les parents qui choisissent de retourner aux, aux études. Um, comment vous voyez cette situation-là uh, post-COVID et, et peut-être un peu l'exemple à l'Université Laval? Je pense que dans cette, euh, il y a des différents éléments là, parce qu'on a commencé en parlant de cette euh, génération perdue euh, ou potentiellement perdue à risque et euh, il faut réaliser que nos universités se sont diversifiées, sont beaucoup plus inclusives dans toutes les perspectives du terme. Et on a de plus en plus d'étudiants, étudiantes qui décident de, de le faire tout au long de leur vie. Alors, à l'Université Laval, on considère qu'on a 38 de nos étudiants qui sont dans un processus d'apprentissage tout au long de la vie et qui décident de revenir à un moment donné dans leur vie aux études pour se requalifier, pour venir chercher une spécialisation, pour commencer leurs études universitaires parce qu'ils ont fait deux choix dans leur vie. Et euh, on voit dans la diversification de nos étudiants qu'on a plus d'étudiants par an, on a plus d'étudiants qui euh, étudient et travaillent, donc qui sont dans une logique de conciliation études-travail assez intensive, surtout dans la période pré-COVID. Dans la période pré-COVID, au cours des dernières années, dans la région de Québec, le, 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 le taux de chômage était tellement bas qu'on se retrouvait à voir nos étudiants changer complètement leur mode d'études à grande vitesse. Donc, on a une génération qui arrive, qui arrive euh, perturbée, mais avec de nouveaux, euh, de, des compétences très, très riches. Hein. Euh, D'avoir été étudiant dans la période COVID, c'est pas rien. C'est difficile, ça a demandé énormément de résilience. Il y a 1,4 million d'étudiants qui, en deux semaines, ont dû retrouver des bases, euh, s'adapter à un, nouvel, un nouveau mode d'apprentissage et persévérer pour obtenir leur diplôme. Donc, ça, c'est un, une qualité. C est, c est, c est, ça a été développé. Ils ont été les premiers à observer, à observer une société, euh, un, une planète entière se mobiliser autour de, du bien commun, celui de la santé, de la santé pour le plus grand nombre. Et ils en ont compris la complexité. Donc, on a une génération qu'on va peut-être appeler la génération COVID, qui sait, mais qui euh, arrive avec un bagage qui est très différent. Et ça, ça va, oui, ils vont avoir eu des défis, mais il faut faire du judo, puis il faut faire en sorte que cette génération puisse euh, maximiser la valeur de cette expérience-là dans ce qu'ils vont faire plus tard dans leur engagement, dans leur capacité de faire des choses. Donc, ça, c'est une chose, puis je peux être assuré qu'il n'y a aucun... Les universités, là, on ne laissera pas tomber cette génération-là. Il n'y en a pas question. On va tout faire, tout faire pour euh, les accompagner, les amener à terme, puis euh, travailler euh, à, à bâtir avec eux leur avenir. Et euh, je suis particulièrement sensible au message de Tosh quand elle dit qu'il y a un gap, il y a un écart euh, euh, numérique euh, il ne faut pas se mettre la tête dans le sable. On parle à des décideurs publics ici aujourd'hui. Euh, on doit trouver la solution. Puis, une partie de, sa solution, de cette solution, elle a été exposée plus tôt, là. C'est la question des infrastructures numériques à travers le pays. Puis, la, la perspective d'une infrastructure publique versus privée, puis du juste équilibre dans tout ça. Pour nos étudiants qui apprennent tout au long de la vie, euh, ils veulent de la diversité dans l'offre. Et puis ça, on le connaît depuis longtemps, on le connaît avant post-COVID. Puis je vous dirais que euh, dans notre université, euh, on a une offre parmi, euh, c'est la première ou la deuxième, là, dépendamment des jours, euh, en termes de volume d'offres de formation à distance. Ça, c'est notre réalité, tout en n'étant pas une université à distance. C'est pas notre ce n'est pas notre ambition. Mais ce qu'on a euh, développé comme savoir-faire, c'est d'utiliser de, de, les leviers numériques pour avoir une plus grande diversité de l'offre, puis ainsi répondre à des besoins plus larges. Et notamment euh, répondre aux besoins de nos étudiants qui veulent apprendre tout au long de la vie puis qui se retrouvent dans des conditions de vie qui ne sont pas nécessairement propices à venir trois heures par semaine sur un campus et où euh, la compétence de formation à distance pour, 
est très apprécié, pour lesquels c'est très apprécié. Donc, je pense que notre réalité COVID va faire en sorte qu'on aura plus de personnes qui vont venir de groupes qui se qualifient dans, 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 cette, dans ce bassin d'apprenants qui apprennent tout au long de leur vie et qui, pour une période plus ou moins courte, vont se retrouver peut-être avec un défi d'emploi puis vont choisir de se requalifier, de revenir vers nos universités, nos collèges. Et là, il faut répondre à ces besoins-là aussi. Donc, on n'a pas un étudiant, l'étudiant 19 ans qui arrive puis qui fait ses études en trois ans. Là. Si je peux mettre quelque chose dans votre tête, là, même dans le temps, de la, dans le temps avant COVID, ce n'est plus ça la norme. Nos universités euh, euh, apportent des propositions à un grand, grand nombre de personnes qui ont des besoins très différents. Merci beaucoup, Sophie. Um, it's an inspiring outlook for sure. And I think the fact that more people will be enticed to come back and potentially the positive side of a diversity of candidates coming back to post-secondary um, because of all of the online offerings and all the changes that universities have done. And uh, Benoit called me on this uh, during our, 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 our short rehearsal. But of course, in my PhD, I wrote about um, how slow moving and bureaucratic universities are. And I think I might have to rewrite part of that because of course, within a period of, of, of less than a week, um, universities from coast to coast to coast um, went online and um, reached out to their students and supported their students and created all sorts of mechanisms um, to be that, that resilient institution that, that, that cares for students during time of crisis. So I, I, for me, it's an ideal because I think that, you know, universities definitely have had, uh, had a, a negative reputation in that regard in the past. And I think it, it's pretty exciting times, and I think it shows uh, shows how nimble and, and how uh, and how uh, proactive universities can be. And I'm curious a bit about the content of programming. Um, in light of the pandemic and in light of the future of work, how will that fundamentally change not just the the way of of teaching, but actually what is being taught and the, and the foundation of learning. And uh, Benoit, we we had an interesting discussion about the idea of generalist versus specializations and how is that changing and how will it change of course none of us can can predict uh, exactly but I'd, I'd love your insights on that uh, that would be my pleasure to start on that question julie thanks and uh, i didn't mean to give you a hard time uh, about universities uh, being uh, quick to adapt i was just worried that you would get into your second specialization which is failed presidencies and uh, every time you call me i wonder if i should be worried it's a joke uh, let's see, um, uh, the content of programs, um, uh, I, I think an ungenerous view, let me start with an ungenerous view, uh, is that the fields of knowledge have emerged uh, out of uh, ignorance uh, hundreds of years ago uh, as points of light, uh, so to speak, and they've grown organically over time. So we've developed bodies of knowledge around certain paradigms. Uh, that have grown in and of themselves organically, not necessarily to respond to any needs or to respond to any special problems. Uh, I, I think as those fields grew uh, and uh, started to touch each other, uh, the most interesting uh, developments often occurred at the boundaries of those fields. Uh, and that's where we enter uh, the realm of uh, what I call, uh, what we call multidisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity. Uh, and from the moment that you're into multidisciplinarity uh, as uh, the favored approach to solve complex problems, uh, it erodes the very notion of the specialist, uh, I think, uh, or at least the argument can be made uh, that the pure specialist, uh, which I, I think uh, peaked in the, 20, in, in the 20th century, uh, that was a, a 10,000 year rise of the specialist uh, to the hyper specialization of the 20th century with, uh, with Henry Ford, uh, and medicine being another example where you stop to be a health specialist, you're a specialist of a, a special disease within a special organ, roughly speaking. Uh, so the same has occurred in academia. Uh, there, there's an expression called the T-shaped learner, uh, where uh, you expect uh, people to have uh, deep knowledge within a field or within a discipline or, or to have one particular skill that can, dis that, that can, uh, that can be very powerful vertically, uh, but also requires for the individual to have broad knowledge because without that kind of broad knowledge, uh, there's nothing that you know within your discipline 
uh, that you can communicate broadly, uh, that you can link uh, with uh, other solutions that come from different fields of knowledge and so on and so forth. So uh, I hope I'm going to get some support from my colleagues uh, for, for the idea that whereas obviously uh, we need to continue uh, to give uh, students to have uh, more of a desire to specialize uh, in uh, a variety of uh, narrow uh, activities, fields or skills, uh, we need to supplement that, uh, that uh, learning uh, with both uh, uh, a broad base of uh, learning and skills across fields uh, and skills uh, in, the, in thinking, but also in being. Uh, and if I can end there, uh, if all we do with our students is to prepare them cognitively uh, in terms of problem solving uh, and in terms of uh, contributing intellectually, uh, we're only feeding one half of the brain and, and, and the whole other half uh, about, being, uh, about, uh, about being able to deal uh, with stress, uh, about having a balanced uh, mental health, about being resilient, uh, about being empathetic and caring as well, uh, which is not always being uh, touched as, uh, as much as it should uh, in university. And to me, that's also multidisciplinarity to be able to, uh, to have the broad set of professional and personal skills to take a holistic view of life. Great, thank you, Benoit. Um, Sophie, en termes de, de contenu, um, ce qu'on voit à Laval ou même peut-être ailleurs, est-ce que vous voyez le changement dans les différentes disciplines? Est-ce qu'il y a des disciplines qui émergent dans ce nouveau monde-là uh, post-COVID? Puis comment, qu'est-ce que vous voyez uh, à votre institution ou ailleurs? Je pense que les gens vont, se, se, vont regarder leur futur beaucoup avec la lunette du moment. Donc, à ce moment, la société tout entière est préoccupée par des défis de santé, des défis de gestion de risque, des défis de développement. Et pour relever ces défis-là, on a besoin de de connaissances, bien évidemment, de, mais de connaissances euh, assez diverses, hein, parce que c'est des défis qui sont complexes. Donc, je suis plutôt d'accord avec euh, Benoît Antoine qui a, qui a un, un effet euh, nécessaire de continuer d'avancer une formation plus large euh, afin que même si on est spécialiste, on est capable de, de mettre en œuvre des changements. Mais on peut s'attendre à ce que des domaines comme euh, la santé, la gestion des risques, la, 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 les données, la science des données. On a beaucoup parlé des faits, de statistiques, de données plus ou moins justes, bien utilisées, d'intelligence artificielle. Donc, tout ça va venir conditionner, je pense, les gens dans leur perspective de « moi, j'ai envie de contribuer ». Donc, ça, c'était des défis qui ont été plus ou moins bien relevés. Je vais étudier dans ces domaines-là. Je pense que ces choses-là vont arriver. Une chose est sûre, une chose est sûre, c'est que dans la, la, la génération actuelle, c'est une génération, je, je prends les plus jeunes, c'est une génération qui est, qui est très animée par le développement durable. Pour eux, c'est la plus grande menace à l'humanité. Et ils ont vu la planète euh, sauver la planète pour un virus. Alors, ils comprennent bien qu'on peut poser ce grand geste-là. Et je pense que plus de jeunes vont vouloir euh, développer leurs connaissances autour du développement durable pour être capables de, de faire bouger les choses. Ça, j'en suis convaincue, on le voit. Ça, de, de, de permettre une requalification rapide, euh, upskilling, euh, des... des, des plus de formations courtes de contenu qu'on peut livrer court qui vont pouvoir, euh, euh, je vais parler par exemple, euh, une, le blockchain. OK? On veut parler de blockchain. Bien, le blockchain maintenant, c'est une formation qui, ça, qui se colle bien à des gens qui ont fait l'information, le droit, qui ont fait l'administration, qui ont fait euh, l'économie. Donc, on va, on va retrouver plus de ces courtes formations qui vont venir compléter, puis un peu à l'image de ce que Benoît disait tout à l'heure, euh, une formation peut-être plus euh, disciplinaire, mais dans le temps. Donc, des gens qui sont au travail, qui reviennent. Ça, on va voir de ces contenus-là. On le voit déjà. Euh, chez nous, c'est dans ce type de formation 
qu'on a la plus grande croissance. Donc, euh, c'est vraiment en demande. Excellent. And um, Tosh, perhaps you've lived the most transformational change um, in terms of, 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 of changing from a, a college to a university at a very, very complex and unprecedented time. And could you talk a bit about the effects of, of all of that and of COVID and what that means for UConn University? Yeah, I, I mean, I think UConn University has, uh, even as a college, we had really perfected the idea that we had this massive territory and we needed to find a way to connect these small remote communities and, and the learners within that. Uh, so, we, you know, we have some really strong skills in, in outreach and distance education that have been perfected over, over this time. So I think we started off COVID probably better place than some institutions. Uh, I think we have small class sizes. You know, you're not going to find 700 students in a lecture hall uh, in UConn University because we don't have a lecture hall with that many students. And we'd probably have to put all of the programs in one lecture hall to do that. Uh, so our small class sizes have, have made us really nimble. We can um, do some really cool things. Uh, it's a technology, something we've embraced early on. And so I think we've got some good uh, groundwork in that piece. Uh, you know, we've been challenged by our Indigenous communities for years on how to be able to offer programming in their community that's relevant and respectful of their culture. You know, we've run culinary arts programs uh, via satellite uh, into places like Old Crow, which is a fly-in community already. Um, so I think UConn University will continue to do that. Our challenge, and I think the place that we'll have to enter a space as a leader, is how do we embrace reconciliation indigenization of the academy in this new COVID world. And so, you know, it's about taking programs where traditionally you would hear faculty say, this has to be done face to face, challenging them to embrace technology, but at the same time creating the space in every single discipline. There is not a discipline uh, that I think exists where there shouldn't be some indigenous content and some integration of indigenous worldviews. Having us in a COVID reality gives us an opportunity to shift even the most hard old school faculty member uh, away from that they are the master of the knowledge to a facilitator and creating opportunity in the way they teach not just the content but the way they teach that allows students to bring in their own relevance from their lived experience in their community and that's a really special space where we can as educators facilitate a knowledge transfer and knowledge creation together so a good example of that is a First Nation arts program that would traditionally be done face to face and you, you know, you have your art student create a portfolio. COVID give us, gives us an opportunity to put that entire program online where the instructor now becomes a facilitator and the students now become uh, experts in their own communities and they go and find those experts who are good sewers, who are good artists, who are good carvers and they learn from them in their community and they come back and they show their teacher, their facilitator, their, their professor, their professor that they've shown this skill, that they've got a competency piece in that. So moving away from their ability to regurgitate information towards an ability to prove that they've mastered a competency. And the same I think can be said for nursing, can be said for social work, all of those different pieces. So UConn University has a, a great opportunity to really lean into the challenge of reconciliation and indigenization of the academy in this new digital space as well as providing leadership across the country on what it means to partner with Yukon First Nations. We should not, with First Nations and Indigenous partners across the board, we should not be creating programs that aren't relevant in communities. And when I, you know, when I was growing up, we, we were looked at and said, you could be either a nurse, a teacher, a rock truck driver, or work for your First Nation. And distance made a, it made a big difference. It used to matter where you were born. But with the digital realities, that's disappeared. We have successful entrepreneurs running multi-million dollar businesses from the north and they've never stepped foot in New York City or, or other major, major city centers. So we need to be able to, to lean into that and build our students' capacity to run amazing businesses from small remote communities, to challenge them to be able to think from a, a systems perspective, to challenge some of the biggest systemic issues we're going to face in the, the, their generation, whether that be climate change, racism, all of these pieces. How do we give them the skills to be systems thinkers so they can contribute, whether that be the private sector, public sector, but do it from their home community and still be able to live the cultural life that they want to. And, and those are amazing things to be able to see. If, if anybody had told me when I was five years old that I could be anything I wanted to be in my village of 100 people and never have to leave there, I think the, the goals I could have had would have been phenomenal. And so we, you know, we have to be able to take advantage of these opportunities that COVID's given us to say, this is the first time I didn't have to ship my nephew 
from my home community to Whitehorse to go to high school. He could do it at home and we could be there to support him. And that is a very cool thing. And so not all of COVID is bad, but you know, we can help, uh, we can help bring some light to it that way. Other jurisdictions have talked about some of the bandwidth challenges that have been solved via COVID. Has it been the same thing in the Yukon? That is a solid no, Julie. We have some <laughs> huge bandwidth issues for sure. Um, you know, though I would say in the digital divide, it isn't always just about the bandwidth. It's fine to have internet right up to somebody's house, but do they have the resources to bring it into the house? And are we giving them the skills that they need to interact with that way? And, you know, COVID has shown us that almost all of the resources uh, that we use to support students, for example, or even in healthcare can be done digitally, but it's based on the assumption that people have devices, they have internet access and they know how to use them. And that's not always the case in many of our communities. And so we've really, we're having to look at some big pol policy shifts in not just education, but healthcare and justice to make sure that that equality is there. And that if we're gonna say in order, here's these benefits and in order to access them, you can do it online. Well, we better make sure everybody knows how to do that and they have access to a device to do it and they have the internet to do that. And that is definitely not the case across the North. Ben, well, a question for you around the way that we're learning. You know, there's been such a, a shift towards work integrated learning in, in universities and, you know, co-op programs and uh, experiential learning. And what does this mean? What does the pandemic mean for all of these hands-on programs? Uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what the pandemic means uh, for these programs. Uh, uh, for sure, uh, there's been tremendous momentum uh, for these types of activities over the past, uh, let's call it 10 or 15 years. Uh, whether it's co-ops or internships or uh, undergraduate research or, from my perspective, international travel is part of that too. Uh, activities that are meant to be more hands-on, uh, to favor the development of, uh, of skills in, in a practical way. Uh, an important component of this that is not often enough uh, emphasized is that it's not only the doing that matters, it's the reflecting on the doing. Uh, you need to uh, perform the task, uh, perform the, the co-op or the stage or the research, uh, and then have a reflective piece. What does that actually mean? Uh, and not just what have I learned in a kind of grocery list way. Uh, how does, how is my thinking expanded as a result of that? Uh, what uh, skills have I gained that will allow me to do what kind of uh, other activities uh, in future? So uh, that's a very, very powerful way to learn. That's a costly uh, way to learn. It, it, universities have invested, invested fortunes uh, towards uh, being able to better serve our students that way. Uh, it's a form of learning that is also very difficult to scale up uh, to the entire student population. It, it's quite easy to do. Uh, for say a hundred students, like we're doing uh, in our partner with our partners in, Sh in Sh at Shopify in Ottawa, uh, where uh, our computer science students uh, do ha do have their time at Carleton and have their time right there at Shopify. Uh, it's much tougher to do for thirty one thousand students. Uh, so there's a there's a challenge there. Uh, may maybe uh, COVID will show us uh, that it's possible to leverage uh, digital technology for some of these activities. I was really interested in Anne-Marie in the, in the previous uh, uh, conference saying that uh, uh, 1,500 of, uh, of their interns uh, were provided with, with computers and would be able to complete their work integrated learning uh, and their internships from all over the world uh, digitally. Uh, to me, that's fantastic news uh, and we're doing uh, similar things. Uh, with our co-op and internship uh, programs uh, at uh, Carleton, so uh, maybe uh, maybe it's maybe it will provide the, the possibility of better mesh, better meshing traditional learning uh, and the co-op or work integrated learning, uh, and to give uh, small, smaller but just as meaningful experiences to students, and that will help uh, with uh, the, ma the massification or the scaling up of those uh, of those activities uh, across the spectrum. Super. Sophie, je vais, je vais terminer avec une question pour vous à propos du système plus large, peut-être avec l'œil de l'Université Canada. Um, on est en train de vivre des ruptures vraiment importantes à tous, tous, tous les niveaux. La façon d'apprendre, l'économie canadienne, à le nombre d'étudiants internationaux, les changements puis les, les, les difficultés avec les employeurs, il y a tellement qui change tout en même temps. Pourriez-vous nous parler un peu de qu'est-ce que ça veut dire pour les universités au Canada, euh, puis comment est-ce qu'on est en train de, de prendre le leadership dans ce dossier-là, qui est pas mal, euh, beaucoup de, de ruptures tout en même temps? 
Je commencerai par dire que ce qu'il faut reconnaître, et puis c'est vrai dans toutes les régions du Canada, dans toutes les communautés, les universités et les communautés sont méchées très, très, très serrées. Moi, j'ai l'habitude de dire quand ça ne va pas bien dans la région, ça ne va pas bien à l'université, puis quand ça ne va pas bien à l'université, ça ne va pas bien dans la région. Donc, les communautés euh, et les universités travaillent ensemble, puis de plus en plus. Puis dans la période COVID, on a vraiment vu l'effet de ça. On a vu les universités qui ont « des step up » et ils ont apporté la connaissance, ils ont été très actifs avec les milieux, ils ont été dans l'interaction, ils ont transformé leur formation, ils ont pas juste aidé les étudiants, ils se sont inscrits dans une démarche d'accompagnement, d'appui, de soutien à leur communauté. Et c'est là où on voit la force des universités. Je pense que cette force-là, euh, elle, elle, elle existe, il faut la reconnaître. Ceci étant dit, actuellement, les universités, comme tous les secteurs, là, font face à de très, très, très grands défis, notamment financiers, associés au fait qu'il y a des, des besoins maintenant pour être à la, pour pouvoir, euh, c'est un processus qui doit s'accélérer. On était dans une transformation, on se transforme tout le temps. Hein? Moi, je regarde l'Université Laval il y a 350 ans, puis aujourd'hui, ce n'est plus la même université. On se transforme tout le temps. Mais là, on, il faut faire un, un, un blitz extrêmement rapide et euh, mettre à niveau. Là, c'est un, un, Il y a une question de masse. Donc, les, on a des défis. Nos étudiants internationaux sont à l'étranger euh, et doivent revenir. Euh, on doit les former euh, pour l'instant à distance, mais on a un défi, on a besoin que les frontières s'ouvrent, on a besoin que les étudiants puissent venir. Ça ne vient pas sans effort. Une fois qu'ils viennent, sont en quarantaine, on les regroupe, on les réintègre dans nos activités. On a euh, le défi d'amener nos euh, technologies numériques euh, à bon niveau, puis euh, à, euh, en masse. Ce n'est pas juste d'avoir... Euh, des, des, des quelques salles d'apprentissage numérique, là, c'est en très gros volume. Donc, on a besoin d'un support pour ça. Mais ceci étant dit, on contribue actuellement à une très, très grande expérience de vie, pas de façon déconnectée à nos communautés, avec nos communautés. Et puis, dans cette expérience-là, on voit bien que la transformation de l'enseignement va amener plus de numérique, plus de personnalisation. On ne parlera plus de formation en ligne puis d'apprentissage de, 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 de formation par l'expérience dans les milieux. Tout ça va s'intégrer. On est en train de revoir complètement le processus d'apprentissage. Un bout en ligne, un bout dans les milieux, un bout en classe pour réintégrer euh, la perspective. Donc, les soutiens euh, et les efforts qu'on fait au Canada qui nous mettent euh, vraiment à l'avant-plan la, et qui étaient déjà entamés avant la crise doivent se continuer. Grand effort pour faire plus d'études de de, dans les milieux de pratique, work integrated learning, il faut continuer. Plus d'inclusion, plus de capacité à rejoindre nos étudiants parents, nos étudiants qui sont à distance, etc. Puis l'internationalisation de nos universités. Tout ça, c'est des valeurs ajoutées à nos communautés. Donc, euh, le, les défis sont grands, mais euh, quand on commence à les désidentifier, on a peut-être l'impression qu'on a toutes sortes de, de, de choses un peu disparates, mais c'est un grand tout très cohésif. Puis le défi du Canada, c'est de s'assurer, de s'assurer que nos jeunes... Et ceux qui sont au travail, qui ont une période leur permettant de revenir étudier, peuvent aller au bout de leur ambition, de leur talent. Puis nous, on n'a pas abdiqué loin de là, même si c'est difficile. Dans nos universités, euh, tous sont engagés à faire en sorte qu'il n'y ait pas de génération perdue. Et ça, c'est le, le motto de l'Université Canada. Vous pouvez compter sur nous. Mais on a besoin de travailler ensemble. Les défis sont grands. Merci beaucoup, Sophie, and thanks to all of our panelists. This has been a fascinating discussion, and I think that um, universities across the country are on the stage right now, and, and they're shining. And I think your message that you've provided today is one of, of hope and optimism and, and lots of opportunities for this uh, COVID generation, as they might like or like not to be called. 
And uh, thank you for sharing your insights today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Benoit, Tosh, Sophie, merci beaucoup. C'était un grand plaisir.